Well, so there's a lot of different tactics that we're actually talking about, right? You have cyber attacks, meaning disrupting different networks. You have espionage, taking critical sensitive information. And then you have misinformation, which can either be bots, you know, or people working in kind of these troll factories, putting out false information. And misinformation campaigns goes hand in hand with what's already happening in society. It's not as if there's just the truth and then Russian misinformation. You have a lot of misinformation out there. What Russia does is they amplify you know, and enhance all of these things going on, especially in social media. It is widely acknowledged that politics and security priorities vary from region to region. What threats, interests, and priorities do the Baltic states have? How do external players behave in the region? In this episode, Dr. Matthew Crandall at Tallinn University shares his insights and latest work. Hello, and welcome to the Diplomatic Academy, the conversation podcast. I'm your host, Petros Petrikos. This episode looks at foreign and security policies for the states in the Baltics. And for this episode, Dr. Matthew Crandall from Tallinn University joins us to share his insight. Dr. Crandall, thank you for joining our conversation. Thank you for having me. Dr. Matthew Crandall is an associate professor of uh, international relations at Tallinn University, where he has also defended his PhD in 2016. He completed a master's degree in EU-Russia studies from the University of Tartu in 2010 and a bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University in the United States in political science in 2007. His research interests include small state security and contemporary security threats. He has published in contemporary security policy, defense studies, East European politics, and Journal of Contemporary Central and Eastern Europe. Now, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Crandall, to just, uh, if possible, to give us a brief overview of what actually led you into this uh, path. How come you decided to focus on uh, countries like Estonia and the Baltics and uh, what also encouraged you to pursue your most recent work? Okay, thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. And as you mentioned, I have an interest in Estonia and the Baltic region. Uh, as well as uh, with small states and how they can deal with, um, you know, some of these new security challenges. Uh, for me, it really began uh, when I was younger. This would have been about 2002, 2003, you know, and 2004 as well. Um, I was in Estonia as a volunteer with my church, and just being here um, as a younger person, my first time out of the United States. I'm originally from the United States. It was fascinating, and I remember talking with people, and this was the time when they were joining the European Union. There's a referendum, you know, and I remember specifically one gentleman at a bus stop, I was having a discussion. He said, you know, the real moment of change is NATO, because that's going to secure uh, the Estonian state, or he said something along those lines. And it was such a fascinating time to see a country, uh, you know, joining those those Western institutions to be a part of that kind of societal debate, or at least an observer not a part, but an observer. And it was fascinating. At the same time, you know, there's also um, the Russian question, right, where you had Russian speakers, maybe didn't always see everything the exact same as Estonian speakers. Um, and it was just a fascinating time. It was an extremely interesting experience uh, coming from an American perspective, right, coming from, you know, a big state. And so that was fascinating. And so, you know, after that experience, you know, I graduated in um, political science and then came back to Estonia to do graduate work, and then I'm still here, you know, so that two-year master's program has has turned into, you know, quite the experience here in Estonia. Yeah, it, uh, it does sound like it, and it's exciting to see how, you know, scholars like you are interested in uh, small states, and you engage with the region as a whole as well. So looking actually at the Baltics as it is, as a region, uh, and based on your own insight and what you've seen throughout your research, would you say there are strong prospects for cooperation within the region in terms of foreign security priorities? Is there like, are there any common policies or common priorities that these states have uh, between one another? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question, um, you know, and one, you know, we're, we're working on right now at Tallinn University, um, you know, thinking about these issues. And, you know, you really have to start off and say, well, what, what are we talking about when we talk about the region? You know, oftentimes, you know, we hear the word Baltic and we think about the three Baltic states, you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. 
But there's also this Baltic Sea region, you know, which also includes other states, you know, like Finland, like Sweden, um, you know, and others. And so there's definitely this kind of merging um, where we have a larger Baltic Sea region. And then we also have the three Baltic states. Um, you know, at times you see both where, you know, you see the Baltic states, the three of them cooperating. When there was the coronavirus, they had this kind of Baltic bubble, you know, where they kind of unified some of their travel restrictions. Um, and then you also saw, for example, recently the three Baltic states cooperating in terms of sending Russian diplomats out of the country in solidarity with the Czech Republic. Uh, so you do see unified uh, action and cooperation between the three Baltic states. There's some institutional cooperation, right, like the Baltic Defense College, which has been there for a while now. And you also see camaraderie between the three Baltic states, you know, you know, support uh, for different initiatives that the Baltic states um, may have. Uh, but then you have larger regional support as well. But, um, you know, that might not be as institutionalized in some areas, at least in defense. You know, you have Finland and Sweden that are not members of NATO. But uh, overall, I think you do see a lot of uh, cooperation. You do see a lot of similar priorities. Um, oftentimes in this part of the region, security um, still, you know, kind of uh, goes around, you know, territorial defense and the Russian question, uh, at least after uh, the 2014 conflict in Ukraine. So for I, I don't. There's quite a bit of um, themes in common and you know, quite a bit of uh, cooperation that goes on. Even Sweden and Finland, right? They're not members of NATO, but the level of cooperation is, is extremely high between those countries and NATO. Hmm. Yeah, and that's actually very interesting. Would you say that it's possible to try and make an argument for the region, for the Baltics that being a, a regional security complex? And I mean, if not, uh, if the term doesn't really fit in, then how would you best describe this level of uh, relatively stable patterns of security interaction that states have with one, with each other? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I would, you know, the regional security, security complex, um, you know, that's an idea, right, by uh, Buzan and Weaver. And I think that is a good way of, of looking at, um, at the region, especially again, after the 2014, but also after the 2008 war in Georgia. You know, there was a heightened sense of concern, you know, in the region. Some of that concern was uh, already there in the Baltic states, you know, uh, before. But for the region overall, I think, you know, we, we do see a heightened concern. Um, we do see a, a pretty unified view right, of, of what should be done. And, you know, even um, if you look at the cooperation, you know, cooperation has been going on for a long time. I mean, when Estonia regained its statehood in the early 90s, um, you know, there's a lot of cooperation between Finland and Estonia in terms of shaping and, and kind of forming some of the defense forces. So I think that, you know, cooperation has, uh, and, you know, Sweden as well, like especially um, leading political support, you know, to help encourage the, the Russian troops to finally withdraw from Estonia. And I believe it was um, late 1994. I think there's definitely been a sense of cooperation between the different countries. Uh, and I think that, that regional security complex um, certainly does work because the concerns of the region definitely are similar. It's it's not, um, oh, well, just Latvia's concern over there, right? I mean, that's something that the other countries share. You know, they share those same concerns. Yeah, but because of this question, like regional security complex is a model, right? So it's it's more of a theoretical approach to understand something that already exists within a given framework. And from purely a theoretical perspective and while engaging with uh, the literature, so international relations and security studies and the debates that uh, we see in the literature, where would you situate yourself uh, within these debates, uh, when it, especially when it comes to Estonia and uh, the Baltics? Well, that's a really good point. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a mutt where I, I don't necessarily just describe to a single theory. You know, I kind of view a theory as a tool in your tool belt. You know, you kind of pick whatever tool you want to kind of do whatever you want, depends on the job that you're working on. And there are different ways of looking, you know, at the region and looking at international relations. So usually I kind of go back to, you know, either constructivism or realism. You know, I guess um, neoclassical realism provides a little bit of flexibility, at least. You know, and constructivism, I think, just helps understand the mindset that so often is evident in uh, international relations. And if you look at the region, you know, you do have differences at times, you know, whereas before we, we mentioned that, you know, it can be considered a regional complex. Uh, but there are differences between the Baltic states and some of the Nordic states. And even little things like physical, material, tangible 
elements, you know, infrastructure. There's a lot of, of differences that are trying to be overcome. So, so in addition to realism and constructivism, also kind of geopolitics, I think, is is evident because you know realism looks at the balance of power, but most realists don't focus um, at the spatial or location aspect that much. You know, some do. Mearsheimer talked about the stopping power of water, but uh, you know, most realists not as much. So, so geopolitics, I think, also is a very important framework, especially for the region. And some even get into critical geopolitics, which again, kind of, you know, in some ways combines this constructivist aspect where, you know, a lot of it can be perception, not just, you know, the mountains and, 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 that, and that aspect. Perception, the narrative, the discourse that they choose to use. And, and, and also neoclassical uh, realism could also be uh, employed as a foreign policy analysis tool. So, and, uh, and then you have uh, the geopolitical framework as well to try and understand how the whole region fits in. So I would I would agree that it's not easy to just handpick one single theoretical framework or a th- an IR theory for that matter. It's useful to be able to understand and view these situations, these case studies, if you like, from different perspectives. I feel that also, you know, in the, the case of the Baltics and, and Estonia, it's just uh, there, there, there's a lot of things happening both at a systemic level, but also domestically. So the as you, you, you've said at the very beginning, that you are also intrigued by this uh, sort of distinction between, uh, you know, the uh, w- with the Russian speakers, for example. So like different countries have also experienced conflict. They've also employed these narratives. So from a constructivist perspective, that is also very useful as well. Yeah, I would say that it's not useful to just look at and point out to one single theory. Now, I want to ask you another question. I'm, I'm going to read out a statement, and I would like to, you to expand a bit on how you feel about the statement. The Russian Federation has promoted in the past different campaigns of cyber attacks and misinformation with a spike in recent years. Um, yes, I, I, when I read that uh, statement and heard that statement, you know, it seems like a pretty... You know, I was almost uh, wondering, you know, is this supposed to be a, a gotcha question or something? Because, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of how it is. You know, we have seen a resurgent Russia mm. and we have seen cyber attacks. You know, you can see those in Ukraine. You saw that in Estonia. You know, they were used in the Georgia conflict in 2008. And we've seen a lot of different um, techniques, you know, now, mostly here in the region. You know, we focus on the 2008 Georgia war, the 2014 Ukrainian conflict, as well as, you know, some of the military exercises, which you know are not military conflict, but kind of still fit this theme ability and and potential motivations but i mean russia has been active you know they've been active in syria you know and so yeah it's definitely a resurgent russia and uh, when looking at kind of what russia has done russia is not easy to to understand i remember there was a a conference once and the speaker listed a long list of, of factors that you know people who study russian foreign policy will kind of focus in on a on a certain factor and there is a lot of them you know and they all have a lot of truth to them but I think one of one of the factors is ability, right? Where these, I don't remember who said it, but you know, uh, it's been said about Putin that you know Putin does a very good job of playing the cards he has been dealt, right? So when when looking at certain capabilities, new capabilities, right, um, new tactics, or at least maybe old tactics that are adapted for a new world. Um, I think Russia has been very creative, but also very willing to really use some of these tactics um, and capabilities. Um, to try to pursue their agenda. And if you look at a lot of the IR theories, you know, we have a world that is in a period of turmoil, right, a period of change. Uh, And so I think in that sense, it gives Russia cover to be more bold um, and also maybe explains why Russia is willing to be more bold, right? There's a, a, you know, the the win-loss kind of um, ratio, right? There's there's quite a bit to be gained uh, and maybe not as much to be lost. You know, and I think a lot of what has unfolded has really maybe confirmed to Putin that, you know, his choices from his perspective, right, um, were probably worth it again for him. You know, I I would not classify those foreign policy decisions as moral. um, And, you know, I think they're disappointing. But from a Russian perspective, you know, you can see the United States is focused on China uh, for the most part. And they have acted in a way that has not evoked this type of a strong deterrence, right? There's no rockets or military response. They've been bold, but they've kind of hid behind that line of deterrence, right? Of kind of 
when the West has decided that they will retaliate, Russia hasn't crossed that line. Um, so in that sense, I think we can still look back and explain a lot of the behavioral choices. And, you know, that happens, you know, during times of transition, times of a change in power balance, you know, sometimes, you know, times of new technology, uh, you know, you can get more conflict, uh, coercion and competition. Do you feel that these tactics, these uh, attacks, if you like, and the misinformation as well, do you feel that Russia prioritizes specific targets or regions to engage in this? Or is this something that it universally applies in general, wherever it has a set of foot of interest in any particular region? So, for example, would it, well, let's say, would Russia be more interested in employing these tactics in the Baltics or the Middle East or, or is it just, or does it not really matter at this point? Well, so there's a lot of different tactics that we're actually talking about, right? You have cyber attacks, meaning disrupting different networks. You have espionage taking critical sensitive information, and then you have misinformation, which can either be bots, you know, or people working in kind of these troll factories putting out false information and, and misinformation campaigns goes hand in hand with what's already happening in society. It's not as if there's just the truth and then Russian misinformation. You have a lot of misinformation out there. What Russia does is they amplify you know, and enhance all of these things going on, especially in social media. And, and so different tactics work for different regions. Um, but I think certainly, you know, Russia is focused on, um, certain regions more than others. You know, I mean, I think that is because of political importance and then also because of what they're capable of. Um, you know, for, for the United States, that's a large geopolitical foe. You can look at maybe David and Goliath, right? Where, you know, if you're Russia, the Russian Federation, and you're thinking, you know, how are you going to compete? How are you going to engage with this competition with the United States? You know, you're not going to go and just kind of engage in a traditional sword fight. But, you know, you can go and you can manipulate the way a population thinks, and you can get significant results uh, through that. So I think, you know, Russia certainly is interested in the Baltic region. You know, it is interested in uh, Europe. It's interested in the United States. I'm not sure how effective misinformation campaigns would be in the Middle East. I mean, I think for, for Russia, it would be easier for them to engage in Russian and English speaking uh, right, information campaigns. And you know, so, so I'm, I'm not sure how much Russia has engaged in misinformation campaigns and that sort of the Middle East. Um, so it kind of goes with, you know, what are Russia's priorities and then, you know, what is Russia effective at, you know, where can they have an influence? Right. Yeah. Because you've uh, mentioned both the both Russia and the United States, to, to what extent would you say that these two have antagonized over the Baltic region since 2007, for example, since after the attacks, the cyber attacks on uh, Estonia? You know, this is a good question. Um and in some ways, I guess this is a, you know, a chicken or an egg. Um, so when you look at all of these, and what we're really talking about is kind of like a, a multi-layered set of relationships and which causes which I think is an interesting one. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, I don't think it's the Baltic states that create tension between Russia and the United States. Certainly there are tensions between the Baltic states and Russia, but, you know, I think tensions between Russia and the United States would have happened independently. And if you look at uh, different U.S. administrations, there's always been tensions. There have also been attempts at cooperation. You can go back to the early 90s in the New World Order, but there's always something that, that causes tension. You know, um, in the late 1990s, right, it was the Kosovo War, you know, with Primakov, who was, you know, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Russia at the time, you know, having a very hard line stance. But then you go back and, and find, you know, missile defense system, you know, or 2003 Iraq war, right? And, and there's a lot of different examples supporting the color revolutions. So there are so many different points that have caused um, tension between the United States and Russia. You know, I think the Baltic states would actually be lower down on that list, you know, significantly lower down, you know, after missile defense, um, and some of those other, some of those other ones. So that, that would be my uh, my take, uh, at least, you know, I think um, for Russia, they, they're more probably concerned with what happens after the Baltic states. Uh, again, you know, would Ukraine join NATO, right? Kind of, you know, to, to what extent does the West increase their influence at Russia's expense? That would have, that's how Russia, I think, would view it. So I don't think it's necessarily the Baltic states themselves, but um, just kind of the overall West, Russia, 
engagement which they see and so again going back to the 2008 mm. you know georgia 2014 ukraine i mean i think that's where we see the significant tension points mm. you know i think the baltic states again you go back to 2007 uh, as you mentioned there's the bronze soldier riots you know ethnic russian speakers not necessarily ethnic russians i mean there's a, a lot of different ethnicities there but russian speakers you know were, were very upset then there were cyber attacks right um, energy transit uh, you know gas and oil was was not shipped through Estonia anymore. Uh, so there's a significant period of tensions. Uh, if you remember Lavrov in a press, uh, right, foreign minister of, of Russia in a press conference said very sharp words towards the West, you know, said, how can you support these countries? So certainly there have been moments of tension, but I, I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily put, put those, you know, countries up. In the West, we sometimes do that. In the United States, you know, there's, there's kind of, um, this is this old debate going back into the 90s, uh, well, you know, should the Baltic states have joined NATO? Well, was this a tension point? But I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the Baltic states did everything to join NATO, right? They're model allies. And I think the West has appreciated that. Uh, and I think, honestly, Russia has accepted that and moved on. You know, this this happened at a period when Russia was significantly weaker. Again, they joined in 2004, but the, the preparation and cooperation uh, between the West and the Baltic states happened well before that. Uh, you know, Estonia was the first country to leave the ruble zone. It was very clear from a very early time period that the Baltic states were done being uh, an ally of Russia. I mean, this uh, this Belarusian model or Ukrainian model. I mean, those decisions were off the table almost immediately. Um, certainly within a couple of years. Uh, and so for for Russia, I mean, I really think they have accepted the fact that the Baltic states will never be, you know, really one of of their key allies or Russia's ability to influence these countries really will be significantly minimal. I, th I think, you know, they've accepted that. And I don't think that the Baltic states have been, you know, one of the key reasons for, for tensions between the West uh, and Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's quite insightful. It's, it's quite interesting as well to see this deeper understanding as to how different states perceive different actions in different ways, of course. You know, different actors like Russia, for example, they, they want to prevent this eastward expansion. Like, they don't want to, they, they feel that the West, if uh, it's recruiting or if it's attracting former Soviet states into its own sphere of influence, then they, they are concerned that this is actually at the expense of Russia, as you've said. Do, do you feel that there are any strategic and realistic priorities? in the Baltics and specifically in which small states choose to promote and enhance resilience in order to combat different perception issues, other domestic political issues. For example, Estonia is a very good example of how they actually openly share a lot of information, sometimes information re uh, revolving around the issue of national security, and they openly share and redistribute this sort of information. Do you think that examples like this is an attempt to promote and enhance resilience within the wider population, or is it something else? Well, I think there's a lot of good lessons to be learned here. And, um, you know, my last comment when I mentioned that, you know, well, this maybe isn't the, the focal point of, of the tensions, uh, or at least maybe it's not the reason of the tensions, uh, this, this is a region where, this, you know, this is still, uh, in some ways, you know, where the geopolitical tensions really come to head. Uh, you know, so for my window, you know, I see often the NATO fighter jets, right, that they're making their, um, you know, patrol routes, you know, kind of uh, patrolling the skies here. You know, I'm about halfway between Tallinn and, you know, the, the military air base. So we see quite a few transport, military transport planes as well. So this is kind of where geopolitics comes to a head uh, in a lot of ways. And so for the region, they do, they do have to take things uh, seriously. Um, and I think you can find a lot of good examples you know, of, of the regions, uh, you know, building up resiliency, building up deterrence, uh, building up, you know, defense uh, tactics. Um, and so what you mentioned, I think, was a good one is uh, definitely quite a bit of transparency in terms of information that uh, is being put out, just being very open. Uh, I think for small states, you know, sometimes you might almost get the opposite of, you know, they don't want to maybe show themselves as being weak or having problems. But, you know, I think Estonia, as they view transparency as very much a strength and say, so, you know, hey, these are the challenges that we face. You know, this is what we've done about them. Uh, this is what continues to be a concern. You have, uh, you know, kind of these um, yearbooks uh, that some of the Estonian services will put out. Or, for example, if there's been a spy or a double agent, you know, these type of things, you know, pretty open about 
right, what's, uh, what's happened. So I think, uh, and then the other thing I think also with the Baltic states have been very good about is maybe two things, um, and you kind of mentioned them. You know, the first is this um, perception, you know, where the Baltic states have put forth extraordinary effort to be perceived as model allies, you know, core members of Europe, not just some random peripheral countries, you know, um, you know, whether it's sending troops to Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, adopting the euro uh, currency, you know, there's a lot of different things that, that countries can do, but they've been very eager and put forth a lot of efforts to, to kind of change perceptions. And I think that's important. And then the other one is, is kind of the, the cold, hard facts, material, physical, uh, geographical constraints. And so the Baltic states are really on an island, right? Especially um, this is used um, in energy, right? This energy island. And so enormous efforts have been made um, to, to build resiliencies. That's a good word that you used to make sure that certain vulnerabilities are decreased. And, and that's what countries need to do in small countries. You know, you can kind of look at what are the tools of coercion? Is it a trade boycott? Right? Is it a cybersecurity attack? Is it something about um, keeping data safe? Uh, is it energy? What kind of energy supplies do we have? Is there going to be disruption in the flow of energy? Is there going to be a spike in the price, right? Kind of what, uh, what are some of these concerns? You know, is it somehow uh, access uh, to lending? You know, whatever the small state, there's going to be different concerns. And so the Baltic states have made a lot of efforts to improve some of these situations. Uh, now, in the Baltic states, they've received a lot of financing from the European Union, because some of these projects uh, are extremely expensive. You can look at the Rail Baltic project. You can look at um, different electrical cables uh, linking right the Baltic states to Nordic states. You can look at li liquefied natural gas. In a few years, there will be the, the synchronization of the electrical grid uh, with the continent, European continental grid. So there's quite a bit of kind of real infrastructure projects that also integrate uh, the Baltic states into Europe. And what that does is that does increase resiliencies, right? It decreases the chance of being coerced by certain mechanisms. Uh, and, you know, that can be done with markets as well. But, you know, in the case of the Baltics, that was done a long, a long time ago. That's actually quite fascinating. I mean, personally, I'm looking at the role of, of infrastructure and critical infrastructure as well. So it's quite interesting to see how this affects resiliency, as you've said, how it establishes some um, I don't know, like some, some additional, um, I don't want to say trust, but I want to say, I, I mean, I guess the word is indeed resilience, how it does build on resilience within the state, the population itself, and how it also attracts all at the same time, uh, the Baltic region closer to the West, closer to the EU. Another question that I have is on uh, what we're all going through right now. So COVID-19, this pandemic, and because we've already touched some basis on uh, misinformation. Uh, I want to ask you about, you know, the, 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 the current situation in terms of security issues, security crisis, uh, and insecurity as well, if you like, because I, I feel that we pretty much see uh, the same old security issues in the Baltic region still prevailing. There's no real change on that. And the new added element is COVID-19. Perhaps there is this uh, sense of insecurity or anxiety generated at the face of uh, the pandemic. But do we see anything else beyond that? Do we see anything else substantial in the region in terms of security or insecurity uh, issues? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, the COVID crisis um, has definitely been a, a, a challenge. You know, I mean, oftentimes when we talk about security or tragic events, uh, you know, in Estonia, there is the Estonia ferry um, sinking in the 90s. Estonia has uh, spent a lot of money and, and taken a lot of efforts to ensure that uh, Estonia is defended against a potential right Russian concern. Uh, but with COVID, I mean, we're talking about 1,200 deaths. I mean, the most tragic event well, you know, in recent history, I mean, that's a very significant tragedy for Estonia. And so certainly I think it is appropriate to discuss, uh, you know, COVID in a security framework where it's not just a little health concern and good thing for the doctors. You know, I, you know it does take extra measures um, for Estonia, for example. They've had to change some of their behaviors. You know, they were extremely hesitant to take loans. They have this kind of, um, you know, Austrian uh, mindset of, well, we just don't want a budget deficit. We don't want debt. Um, and that's, a, you know, for a small 
country, right, with potentially aging demographics, uh, you know, that's probably a good strategy. Uh, but, you know, they're borrowing money because it's, you know, they have to. And so it's definitely been um, a challenge. I think long term, when we, when we think about it, um, Estonia, again, one of the things Estonia has benefited from is membership in the European Union. Um, access to vaccines, for example, um, has also been benefited, you know, as a member of the European Union. You know, they, they weren't uh, engaging unilaterally with all of these, you know, drug companies. Um, you know, they didn't have billions to invest, you know, in these companies like the United States, you know, in the very beginning development phases of these vaccines. So if you look at, you know, Estonia compared to another small state out of the EU, like Albania or something, you know, Estonia has done very well with kind of procurement of the vaccines. So I think for Estonia, they're hoping certainly that life will get back to normal relatively quickly. Um, I think one thing that could be a concern long term is, you know, what does this really mean, you know, for this globalized world? You know, and I think this is a very interesting discussion about globalization. Uh, I think most people in Estonia, uh, and again, certainly not all, um, you do have uh, nationalists and anti-globalists uh, in Estonia that have been gaining support, uh, but most Estonians would look at the European Union, would look at the Schengen zone, you know, open borders as having been very positive for Estonia, you know, being part of, of this Western bloc. And so if there is this kind of hardening of borders, I think long term, that would be potentially a concern for uh, a country like Estonia. This was most evident with discussions um, with Finland, you know, where it was critical to try to keep that border open, uh, you know, to keep people moving. You have a lot of workers in, in Finland, Estonian workers. So, I mean, this ability to kind of go from one European country to another, uh, I think, is, is certainly critical for Estonia. Connectivity, mm -hmm. right? Um, keeping yeah. Tallinn connected to other European capitals, you know, in terms of flights also, right? So those would be things that Estonia kind of long term would would want to continue. And there is that scenario where, well, what happens if there's a new variant of COVID, you know, and it somehow breaks through some of the current vaccines. Uh, and then we're talking about not just a one year issue, but, you know, a five year issue or, or uh, an eight year issue. You know, so then um, I think that's certainly a concern that, you know, Estonia would definitely want to maintain those connections, connectivities, uh, you know, be part of a whole Europe not just part of a fragmented one European country among many European countries. Yeah, it's uh, freedom of movement is very, very important, not just in the economic sense, but uh, going back to what you've, you've just described as well, also for small states, especially having access to these uh, market, if you like, or these resources or this uh, cooperation with their neighbors and then even going into the EU, that's a great asset to have. It's also raised some other issues with uh, how, for example, uh, the um, going away from the region for just a minute, like looking at the United Kingdom, how it was negotiating, it was trying to figure out a way of, to, to maintain some aspects of freedom of movement uh, because that was also so very important, not just for the UK, but also for the EU as well. And, you know... And then with Estonia and uh, and Finland and and um, and the other examples that you've mentioned, it's a fantastic selling point because all those countries that engage in this, that you have to gain out of this. But yeah, there's there's also like uh, the voice of the more populist voices as well that are concerned with uh, increased integration, that are concerned with this interdependentness and globalization. And uh, for their own reasons, they promote other agendas against that. But, and also with COVID-19, we see the, sometimes we see these uh, conditions, these mi misinterpretations, these uh, perceptions being worsening off even because of the growing insecurity, the growing anxiety, the questioning of uh, the vaccines, questioning of uh, what the actual situation and the future, being concerned about the future. So yeah, in, in a way, although there are still some pending security, old security issues in the region, COVID-19 has brought a plethora of other issues as well. It's uh, important to try and make this, dis to the, this distinction and uh, yes, at this point, because I'm also very, I'm very conscious of the time as well. I'd like to ask you this final question, which is just a very uh, generic question as to whether you have 
any would you like to share anything regarding any upcoming projects research that you're working on when it comes to small states or the region itself or estonia or um yeah well i think maybe just an interesting thought whereas you know we focus so much on the region i think um when we look at what's going on globally it's such an interesting world that we have you know we we have uh, a rise of china we have Uh, new institutions, you know, largely kind of based by China, you know, new infrastructure banks, BRICS, uh, as, as well as, you know, others, um, One Belt, One Road initiatives. It's a very fascinating world out there. And so uh, for a lot of states, they're really engaging with these questions of, so what are we going to do now, right? And, and it's not quite the same as the Cold War, where you just kind of look and have your ally, you know, kind of tell you what to do and that's it. Um, I think there is definitely going to be a much more fluid kind of situation. Uh, now, we certainly do see some of that, you know, uh, with China. And this is, I think, maybe the point where that we didn't talk about that, that needs a lot more discussing, you know, 5G technologies, right, where, you know, the Balt or Estonia, at least, you know, signed a memorandum of understanding with the United States, kind of, you know, kind of giving a nod to allies. But there's a lot going on in the world. And, you know, I think there's a lot to benefit for small states, you know, the Baltic states, all three of them have been increasing their cooperation with certain African countries. Um, you know, usually smaller, you know, somewhat more developed uh, English speaking countries uh, in Africa, Baltic states looking to open up more embassies. And so it's just an exciting, interesting time for small states where there are opportunities for new relationships, different kinds of relationships. And, you know, everything isn't going to be about security. Everything's not going to be about Russia. And I think it's a fascinating world. And, uh, you know, I'm rooting for small states, you know, and I am excited to see you know, this changes in the world and I hope that it'll bring more relationships for small states and that those relationships will be beneficial to small states, you know, creating, uh, you know, more resiliencies, creating more political support. And, you know, maybe that's a little foolish because it is a concerning world that we live in, right? There is a lot of conflict and with change comes conflict and, and competition. Uh, but I'm hopeful that there will also be a lot of positive developments uh, for small states out there as well. I think it's good to be positive and I think, because of uh, the the because of what we also see i mean yeah there there are there there's a lot of uh, crazy stuff happening out there indeed but like i i think it's also uh, the different situations also will hopefully lead uh, the world like and all these states hopefully will bring them closer together i mean it's only wishful thinking at this point yeah but we do see increased cooperation in some areas within the global political arena. We, we do see effort in some cases uh, to resolve and, and attempts to resolve conflict or at least at begin addressing it. So, yeah, it's uh, it's good to, uh, to, to end on a more hopeful and positive note. And overall, I will have to say a big thank you because it's been a very compelling analysis and I'm really uh, eager to keep up with this uh, particular kind of work and I wish you all the best in your research and I'm looking forward to reading more about uh, your own work in the, in the future. Hey, thank you, I appreciate you having me.